Yo, what's going on, everyone? Welcome in. Brand new episode of Snaps, youtube.com slash at volume snaps. If you're watching live, we're a little early today. Uh, that's because we are being joined by a very special guest. Uh, one of my favorite minds in the world and just a, 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 a muse of mine, an inspiration in many ways. That is Spencer Hall at EDSBS on Twitter, of course, Channel 6. Um, him and Holly have created this wonderful ecosystem for them to hang out in and have fun. And then you catch him all over your television and everything else. He's just a legend of the college football circus. Spence, what's up, man? Thank you so much for joining us today, dude. No, my pleasure. Thank you for the, uh, kind words. Uh, I, I deserve like maybe four of them. So I'll I mean, I, it's, it's, it. I mean it though. It's one of those things where. There's a few people like this. Uh, you know how you like follow someone who you do the and sorry, I'm not trying to look distracted. I'm I'm just getting on my windows in order over here. But you follow yeah. someone who um you I guess you do the same job, or you're like kind of in similar jobs, right? Right. And you're just constantly jealous of how smart their takes are or how talented they are. Like that's how I feel when I look at your tweets and I'm laughing. I'm like, holy shit, that's funny as fuck. Why can't I be funny like that? So I, I'm very excited to uh, to to have you on today. I would just suggest failing at every other professional endeavor in your career. That's <laughs> it. If you fail at everything else, you can do this job. Um. All right. So look, we got a lot to get to today. Uh, for the nerds out there, I do want to mm -hmm. talk quite a bit of 40k. It'll I'd be a to. wide ranging conversation. Um, Nick Saban, uh, there's a really great retirement piece by Chris Lowe that was just dropped on kind of the madness of the Alabama coaching search, which actually, I guess, and to Greg Burns credit kind of wasn't that mad. Like no. it was, it was actually very well conducted and mm -hmm. like planned for. And he, I think he handled like a champ and divorce an awesome land. I do think there's some interesting comments Saban made maybe about kind of college football that I, that I want to chop up a little bit. Um, maybe get into like a little Zach Arnett. I don't know yet if we're going to get there. I do want to dive into your piece on channel six, uh, which I haven't got to fully read yet, but the, the one thing about every FBS team, yes. kind of your, some of the more interesting lore that you found in your journeys, finding one nice thing about all college football teams. So look, it's going to be a really fun show. So hit the like button. Y'all, uh, pack, if you love, uh, Spitzer, hit the like button, share with your friends. And if you're listening on podcast, rate, review, and help to please the algorithmic gods that rule our existence. Um, Spitz, we were talking about the Iditarod dog race yes. before the show. Um, and if you missed it, Dallas CV got entangled with a moose. He had to kill mm -hmm. said moose. Um, he, he had maybe one of my favorite quotes ever where he was describing having to gut the moose. And he said, I did the best I could. It was ugly. Like that, it was ugly just gives you, if 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 you are someone who is a five-time Iditarod champion and you're telling me it was ugly, that was a grisly fucking scene out there on the track. Come yeah. to find out, he did not gut the moose correctly. He has now been imposed a two-hour time penalty. But you point out something that I didn't even think about. Why do you need to gut the, uh, gut the moose? Okay, number of things i was like giving people something to read and and i don't mean like oh let's let's go read a, a novel no reading is a utility um go look uh at this book it's called uh, okay. a guide to hunting large game and it is by kinsella he's a guy who uh runs the show and the website meat eater i don't know if you're familiar with it but uh he is a great hunter like this guy is like super pro hunting and he talks about moose and if you hunt moose you need a good friend why because hunting moose is going to test your friendship it is going because there is so much to haul out yeah. there's more moose inside a moose than you might even think if you've ever seen a moose they're big as hell that's a scientific term i don't they're think i've ever seen one dude i don't think i've ever oh. seen one live because they're not at, they're not at zoos really right like no i, I don't know yeah you the habitat would be unmanageably huge and it would have to be wet. It's like because they live in marshes. <laughs> um, I walked up on I walked up on one in Colorado in uh, a marshland next to uh, sort of the Grand Lake area, and I didn't know I didn't know it was there until I was ten feet away from it. I'm pretty oblivious, what but I'm not that oblivious. They're quiet. 
they're quiet. They disappear very quickly. They're very hard to hunt. They're very hard to find, obviously. And, and honestly, they can disappear fast. So like if you don't get your shot off or you make a noise, they'll dis they'll vanish on you. And you don't really want to get super aggressive chasing them because they will beat your ass. They yeah. beat yeah, more people are attacked by moose every year than by bears. All right. They they do not want to be around you. They prefer their privacy. They like their personal space and you should give it to them. So uh, why do you have to gut the moose? Because it's huge and you don't want to create a nuisance by having a big gut pile out there for bears. You don't want bears rooting around inside an unbutchered carcass. It's always the bears. Don't create a nuisance because do you know what will really mess up dog team and a, and a musher? A Kodiak. That's yeah. why. Okay. Yep, yep. So people are going to say, well, man, why did he get this? Why did he get this time penalty? Or why did, well, they got a time penalty because you're creating a, an additional danger, right? Yeah. It wasn't your fault you encountered the moose, but you have to handle it. Yes. I see a commenter calling this a moosence. That is correct. <laughs> that is a moosence. You don't, you don't want to correct that. Well done. Uh, it, um, yeah, it, I, I, I want to say I, I was happy to learn. Look, all the meat has apparently been mm -hmm. processed. It's all being delivered. So yep. the moose sacrifice, not in vain. Uh, it's going to feed some people as anytime you talk about hunting. I think that's kind of the main base level goal that I want is just eat what you kill. Mm -hmm. um, it did lead me down a bit of an Iditarod wormhole, though. I mean, yeah. a thousand miles over frozen rivers and mountain ranges. There is something mm -hmm. ancient about this race uh and, and then i was inspired by you know your 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 article and i was trying to look up the colleges of iditarod winners that's kind of hard to do right i don't yeah. know uh, many are kind of people who maybe you know forge their own way maybe didn't go to college or, or like whatever so but do you know the state that is tied with alaska for the most iditarod winners hmm i'm gonna go washington uh, it's actually Minnesota, which makes sense, no, right? I can't see, yeah. Grand Lakes, yada, yada. I was shocked, though. Virginia, second on the list. Virginia has five Iditarod winners. How about that? That's what I'm saying, dude. Big upset there. I'm going to have to figure out why. I'm going to have to figure out why. It has to be like one person, right? I didn't it go too to deep, right? It has to be. We just got like an all-time great. It appears too that maybe the father's like I did around runs in the family, like Dallas mm -hmm. CB, the guy who got the penalties, a five-time winner. If he wins again this year, he'll become the first time, the first ever six-time winner. But like his dad won it multiple times back yeah. in the day. So there's a lot of Iditarod families. And I don't know, maybe there's a Virginia one out there. Dude. Uh you should go read there's a a Grant an old Grantland piece that Brian Phillips wrote about going to the Iditarod and um, I think he learned. I think he learned how to fly a plane for it because it's not a, it's not a sporting event that you can just sort of buy a ticket to, and show up. It's not even an event where like the Tour de France you have to follow it around in a car. Uh, there are no roads. That's why it's called the Iditarod. <laughs> you can't. The only way that you could follow it is if you competed in it. So yeah, uh, go read that because here it, it is, is right here. Yeah, hell yeah. This, yeah, the moose are huge. Uh, the Iditarod is extremely difficult, and uh, you should uh, bring a friend to hunt them. That's what you should. You should always bring a very good friend, not a casual acquaintance, because your friendship will be tested. See, uh, this is what happens when you get two of the premier minds in college football That's right. together. Um, let's talk about, real quick, the, the, the one thing about every FBS team. And by the way, y'all, uh, you can sign up for Channel 6, two things That's every correct. week. Spitzer and Holly doing what they want, giving you stuff that they love to talk about, musings, everything else. Um, and and they went around and they said one found one cool piece of lore for every school in the FBS. Uh, what was maybe the most intriguing, interesting, or just one that you want to bring up? If I was going through it and I had to pick the one that I thought was most interesting, um, one that the University of Alabama campus is uh, definitely haunted, like definitely haunted. That mm. is, uh, it, it, there is a former, I believe, mental hospital that uh, was condemned and is now part of the campus and used for other purposes. So uh, that is allegedly haunted. I thought that was fascinating. Um, the University of Arizona has an has a functioning 
uh, what do you call it? observatory beneath the eastern stands in Tucson? Like uh, beneath functioning. Wait, wait, fun in the stadium? Yeah. They make one of the things they do is they make these huge mirrors that go in telescopes and it's below the stands. It's incorporated into the stadium. What? In Tucson. Yeah. Is the big was that like was that like a funding thing? Like I know like back in the day, Huey P. Long at LSU wanted to make uh he wanted to upgrade Death Valley, he wanted to make it huge, and the way to do it, he put dorms in the stadium. So like right. you can see these little windows on on on, on the side of Tiger Stadium, and they're these old dorms. I actually went in him last year to film like a hype video or two years ago before else you got mm -hmm. their ass kicked by Tennessee. And it had some it has some real walking dead energy in there. Like nobody's lived in there since the 70s, and it's all kind of like there's still remnants of of human habitation. But yeah, I I, I guess I just don't know. Like if 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 you're building a, a an observatory, I guess I'm just not connecting why put it in the stadium where like thousands of people are going to be above it stomping around on it all the time well you need underneath it what you basically need to make these big mirrors is you need an oven because that's how you make a mirror that's how you make glass right you, yeah. you need a place yeah. where you can get stuff real hot in an oven and you need a lot of space and when this guy who was making mirrors this guy who works this this astronomer who works at the University of Arizona? He was making them in baking them in his oven. And he goes, "I need a place to put, to put a really big oven where I can make these mirrors." And the campus uh, managers were like, "We have a place, and it's out of the way, and uh, we only use it, you know, seven, eight times a year. Why don't you come on through?" So yeah, they've got these like big oven type things where they make mirrors underneath the stadium at Arizona. Uh, what piece of lore did you end up finding for LSU? What did we find for LSU? Did you go, well, well, I guess I only asked you this. It wasn't the moon lore, was it? Have you seen this recently? No. LSU. So it was, first, I can tell you, it wasn't the moon lore. Okay, so LSU, the first SEC school on the moon, as uh, they developed a piece of technology called Tiger Eye One. No. Uh, it like measures did, did, radiation levels. We did cite this, that you should okay. be recruiting on the moon. That, yes, that LSU yes. was Just, already <laughs> already advancing into lunar recruiting well ahead of everyone else. That is correct, you guys. Um, well, it's like you have you have China and Russia talking about opening a nuclear power plant on the moon. Yep. But even that headline comes two weeks after Tiger Eye officially stamping uh the 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 purple and gold uh up there on our lunar brother well you see we couldn't use the huey long thing because there's too many good huey long stories and yeah. most of them have been told when it comes to lsu and you have to tell people who huey long is so there's a curve on that if i just tell people hey lsu is recruiting on the moon with advanced ai that's enough I yeah, think that, yeah. how, how else do they have the number one quarterback number one running back and number one wide receiver committed for 25 i mean it's 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 technology it's ai oh my favorite Huey Long story is this, and I think it encapsulates really everything that he was where, you know, in many ways he had very noble goals and did a lot of good mm -hmm. things, but he would just set himself up every step along the way. So he brought roads throughout rural Louisiana, right? Um, which is incredible. He connected these communities that would have never been connected otherwise. All of a sudden they could drive, et cetera, et cetera. But he owned the company that sold the rock he would sell subpar rock mm -hmm. at the premium price. He would yep. wet down the rock to add extra weight. And then he made the roads 18 inches too narrow to make the rock go further. So it's mm -hmm. like he technically accomplished this very noble thing at its core. He just skimmed every single step along yeah. the way, he uh, would do, like at every level. He would do my, he would also do uh, the venerable Southern politician trick of, he would show up to an event or to a facility or a location that was mostly black voters. And he would show up and say, hey, I'm listening to you and I hear y'all. I know other politicians don't do this. So why don't you tell me what you need? And he would hear that and he'd go, great. P.S. Don't tell anyone I was here. Don't <laughs> yeah. tell it. That was <laughs> like, what? <laughs> like doing kind of doing the right thing until the last second, then kind of taking a left. That's very much the Huey Long story. Uh, uh, just a, a, a fascinating, um, mm, individual, basically the dictator of Louisiana mm -hmm. for a while there. Uh, never forget kids. Second most dangerous man in America, according to Roosevelt.
Yeah. Um, all right. The first most dangerous man in America may be Nick Saban. Um, Spencer, where do you see, I want to get into kind of Saban's thoughts and maybe how he felt in his older age about like the off season meetings. I thought it was kind of fascinating and player motivation, but with Saban retiring, uh, if we wanted to start to dabble into some of maybe some 40 K is Saban retiring the death of the emperor of college football, or is it the beginning? Because do you think we see Nick Saban as we enter the, the 2024 gene of college football, right? And uh, a football split looks inevitable, a split away from the NCAA and maybe even a split into like a premier league type of situation. Do you think Nick Saban starts to position himself as the, the kind of commissioner of college football? I think that's a likely position. I think also he's got, uh, dude has a lot of business interests, like particularly mm -hmm. when it comes to his Mercedes affiliation. So I think he's probably got a lot of that on his mind. I know his money got taken care of eventually in coaching, but it might not be what you think it is because uh, like a lot of people in the 2000s, he had some bad investments. So yeah. Um, yeah, he had a couple of here in Baton Rouge. <laughs> <laughs> Go Tigers. Um, yeah, there was a lot of that. And so he's got to take care of that. But I think a couple of things are happening here. One, I think we might be kind of taking trends and trying to come up to grand conclusions out of something which is pretty normal, which is the way I did things doesn't work and I'm 72. That's it. They don't it doesn't work like, yeah. yeah, it really doesn't work. And at a certain point, you have to consider the relationship between the employee who's been doing this real successfully for a real long time and the job, which has changed. That's inevitable, but that's not new. That's Bear Bryant. Bear Bryant had that happen to him during his career. It, yeah. He started off being a guy who's responsible for the Junction Boys. He started off being the guy who his idea of training players was tantamount to torture. And <laughs> by the time he retires, that won't fly anymore. You have to give like consider that 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 his predecessor in greatness, the guy who is probably his most direct comp in terms of Bear Bryant. Um, when he started giving people water at practice was considered weak and <laughs> when mean, he retired. So when we talk really, about like, um, it's hard to, oh. it's hard to wrap your head around. Like it's when actually talk about, like, hard to fathom. Right. When we talk about like, Oh, all the changes in college football. Okay, man. It wasn't from 1950 to 1980 because I'm pretty sure during Nick Saban's entire tenure within football, in college football, as a head coach, water was accepted at practice the whole time. Okay. It's changed a little bit. It hasn't changed that drastically, right? We've lived through or seen bigger changes that we can cite. Well, and, 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 and it, well, yes. And the, but then you, then it's like the major change just all happened so fast. I mean, in terms of some of these seismic shifts, maybe that we've seen in terms of like the NCAA mm -hmm. repeatedly losing all these court cases, portal being wide open 24 seven now, yeah. um, players being paid. And so if you missed the article, uh, Saban said, you know, this is just one of the quotes, quote, I thought we could have a hell of a team next year. And then maybe 70, 80% of the players you talk to, all they want to know is two things. What assurances do I have that I'm going to play because they're thinking about transferring and how much you going to pay me? He says, our program here was always built on how much value we could create for your future and your personal development, academic success, and graduate development NFL career on the field. So I'm saying to myself, maybe this doesn't work anymore. The goals yeah. and aspirations are just different. And it's all about how much money you can make as a college player. Now, I do like this. I, I want to be fair to him. He says, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that's never been what we were about. And it's not why we had success through the years. Uh I here's the deal. I love players being paid. And I know this sounds like I'm setting up for a butt, but I'm really not. I, I love players being paid. I think um I think the market has absolutely spoken. Like the 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 most bipartisan uh political cooperation I've ever seen in my life mm -hmm. are are states trying to make it easier for athletes to get paid. Like if, if Louisiana legislature can't get mm -hmm. shit done, but if it comes to loosening the restrictions so LSU can stay competitive with Mizzou and everybody else, like you damn that that shit gets passed like that, right? Yeah. So the market spoken. I do wonder though, because you're someone who really I think highlights and appreciates the wonderful quirky nature of college football, why it's so unique. Do we lose any of that unique that that uniqueness? Um, as it becomes more professionalized. 
Well, I mean, it's always been professionalized. It's just the sense that that the teams the teams grow to the size of the market. There's a reason hmm. that the NFL has never really, I think, managed to take hold uh, in earnest in the South in the way that it did in you know the Northeast or in the Midwest and parts of the Midwest at least. And that is because the teams that serve the markets down here were at the college level and they were very much professional teams. It's just with an extremely skewed, weird economy when it came to how we paid players, we kind of managed to sneak a professional league in where True. there, where Good there point. were no professional teams. And right now the way that, that market works is um, when people say it's a disaster, I, I like to use words kind of accurately. I'm prone to hyperbole. <laughs> I may be prone to exaggeration. Um, I think disaster is a little strong. It's confusing. It's the market, the new market. And the way that we have, it's an imperfect market too, because we have twin tracks of revenue. And I'm probably going to be writing about this next week if I can get my brain straight. We have twin tracks of revenue. One, you have the actual money, which is currently attracting players in NIL. Yeah. Which is completely firewalled siloed isolated from the money coming in for the value of the product that's messed up that's deeply messed up we have all of this tv money coming into the system the tv money is the thing that is driving this transformative era in college football where we finally looked at the money and said hey uh players should be getting some of that but they're still not now i know, might, I know. they're still not <laughs> because that's still going to the schools we haven't solved anything instead we created and Seth Emerson has a pretty good article about this in The Athletic today. Um, we've created the system where we basically have subscription services for our NIL collectives and football programs, which are different. So I want you to consider, it's not even like we, may, we turn college football into Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime Video or whatever. Um, what's happening is this. We have created a subscription service for college football if you want your team to be good where the actual money generated on the other end is totally isolated and has nothing to do with the money that comes for the production of the product. It is completely divorced. It's very weird. Like it's uh, very, it's very weird that they're totally separated and that won't last. That will not last. No. Court, court challenges will knock that down. Um, you know, the right now um, I see some people in the comments who are like the portal is a disaster. Okay. The portal right now, is a disaster because we can't recognize people as employees and can't give them contracts. Yeah. Right. Everyone in America can enter the portal at their job, except, <laughs> except for college football players who have to not be employees and thus have this weird market. It's, it's very messed up. And, and most other sports have figured out a way well, to solve this. And I think we will eventually, but right now, I, I do sympathize somewhat with a 72-year-old football coach worth several million dollars uh, at the very least because would you want to reinvent yourself and figure this all out? Like, and, like, he, well, and, and, yeah. and he's been like that. He's been, he was so good for so long at adapting, right? Schematically on the field, certainly in a program sense as well. But yeah, I mean, you get older and older and it's just maybe this is just a, a step too far. I mean, Spencer, to me, this all feels like what happens when you accept a, like, this is the fallout from accepting a structure that should have been flatly illegal from day mm -hmm. one, right. but we just all thought was, no, this is like the actual right, correct way to do this. And we did it for a hundred years. Yeah, so of by, course, by, by there's the way, be all you, this weird friction. Do you love that, by the way, that like, really, there are some things that are hardcore illegal. And then there are some things that are just illegal-ish. Like the way we ran college football, I'm not talking for like five years. I'm not talking for 10 years. T-Bob, the way we ran college football was for the better part of a hundred years, illegal-ish. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. And no one had the political will to change it. You know why? Because we had fun mascots. <laughs> if you want to make a fortune and get away with something in America, make it cute, quirky. Yeah. Just dude. be charming. Don't forget the bands. I mean, I, I, love, I love a great halftime show, dude. Yeah, uh, like, like basically nobody did anything about this because they were like, well, it's probably wrong, but it's cool. <laughs> That's it's it. it's cool it, and and it like and it's becoming, you know, increasingly clear. That's why every time they go to court now, they just get 
SmackDown. It, yeah. it, it all goes back to the Kavanaugh letter of a few years ago where he was like, hold on now. Like, this is yeah. actually fucked and like anti American in kind of every other sense. Um, that's what I don't get about the NCAA, though, with NIL specifically is. I feel like from day one, they should have embraced it because mm -hmm. they could have held on to that TV money for longer. Yeah. Right. Because like all of a sudden people aren't clamoring as much. Now it will change. Like you said, and it was funny to watch Harbaugh launch these balloons as he's doing mm -hmm. battle with the NCAA. Like, whoa, well, fuck you guys. I'm probably out of here anyway. Like you better pay the players the TV money. Uh, right. But like, they, they could have gotten away with longer for being like, oh, the players are being paid now. Look, well, while, while they're still hoarding all of their smog TV cash over there on the right. side. And ultimately, if you want to know what's going to fix the portal, right? And the portal is, it's a mess. We don't know who's going to show up. It's like, it is real 1920s hours when it comes to how we manage rosters right now. Because if you know George Gipp, Anybody, anybody ever know George Gipp? That's right. Like Notre Dame, alleged great. Win one for the win one for the win one for the Gipper. Okay, okay. Amazing, uh, and like legit amazing athlete, legendary player of his time. George Gipp, he was at Notre Dame. He didn't have to be at Notre Dame. You know why they kept him there? Because they paid him. This is in the twenties. Did he attend class? No, not <laughs> even close. He spent most of his time at pool halls in South Bend, where, by the way. He made a tidy living hustling other people because he was a very good pool player. God, I love old school football players. Yeah, dude. but we're not far off from that in terms of keeping people on campus. It's very, very tentative right now what you're going to get. And there are people who, even the people who are pretty good at it right now are complaining. Like Lane Kiffin. Lane Kiffin is doing an amazing job because every yeah. single year, Lane Kiffin rolls up in the portal, throws a bunch of dudes out on the field and gets them all on the same page. All on the same page. It's... It's pretty extraordinary because Ole Miss doesn't have the kind of gravity that, say, an Alabama or an LSU even have to hold players there because you'll get in the league. We'll get you in the league. Stay here. We'll get your NIL at least good enough to where we can get two years out of you or get three years out of you. Um, the great hope for, the co for college football right now is that, unlike basketball, you can't just enter the league right out of high school. That's it. right? Yeah. We, still, we still have the yeah. three-year rule. We yeah. still have the three-year rule. I'm a college and, baseball fan, and that's like one of the best parts as well. Is when you get a guy, you're like, okay, I, I we at least have them for three. Yeah, we at least have them for three. So if you have them for three, we at least have a window here where you'll be in the sport. You'll be in the sport, and if we can get something like a contract down, we can solidify our rosters and improve development, by the way. This is something that like the NFL – can't really affect policy on this side too much but the nfl certainly wants that because i think developmentally a lot of what you're seeing the game become in the pros is the result of what the shortcomings of player development at the college level and when i say shortcomings by the way i just mean time and development it just takes you don't get the consistent coaching and you don't get the consistent um like improvement over time that you get because people get antsy people get in the portal um the systems that we are now have are there's definitely more microwave offenses and defenses right definitely more yeah. like okay we're, we're not going to ask you to do as much your technique won't be as developed because we don't have time to do that as a coach i don't have time to do that both because i'm constantly recruiting and re-recruiting players mm -hmm. and trying to teach you how to do 18 million different things as a position coach i can't do that anymore so I'm just going to like guys will come out, especially I think at the offensive line. Like if you want to look at like a position that is, I know, close to your heart, definitely close to mine in terms of like some of my favorite people on the field and guys who I think are emblematic of what the best parts of football are. I think they get shorted in terms of development time and growth curve and potential because they come into the league and they don't know how to do a whole lot of the stuff. They're going to no. need to be successful more and more. College football is like a law degree. You can go get it. It doesn't mean you know how to practice law <laughs> at all. It well, and then, and got then in. If, with O line specifically, you're kind of hit with the 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 double blow of, like you said, maybe you've played in like uh, a, a air raid or spread style offense, you're, right? Like like you've never been in three point stance. Uh, the quarterback's always getting the ball out of his hands, so you're not having to hold pass blocks. But then you also go to league, and you don't have that many padded practices, nope. so you kind of like. Like you can kind of only really get your reps on game day 
which becomes kind of insane. And it means that only the best players are able to stick around long enough to become these greats. It is, it's fucking tough out there for the O-line. It, it's why I really do love like, um, oh, why am I blanking? Is it, is it Charles Bentley uh, who runs the O-line? Uh, like mm. he has an O-line camp thing down in Florida, but it's like become the summit that they all go to and gather yeah. and try to figure out how to train in this new modern age. But um, no, you're absolutely right. That, that's one of the toughest transitional positions. It is. And, it, and I, I think, too, with foot, with, with quarterbacks, it, if that's the way offensive linemen are, and if we're putting our best athletes along the defensive line, right, then what you're going to see is a game that's key to that. You're going to see a game that that works with that and doesn't insist, well, we're, well, we should do it this way and we should. No, no, I'm just going to go with what you give me because that's the shortest path I have between keeping my job and thriving, right? Like I can, yeah. that that's the shortest path to win. Um, that's an interesting comment uh, like from the, the gallery here talking about uh, athletes as like independent contractors. I did the wrestlers being independent contractors, which is what they are, by the way. Like really the highest, still even now um, with the WWE, I'm pretty sure that's still the deal. Right, I can't speak to AW. I feel bad, but like sometimes with WWE and Vince McMahon, I'm like, uh, like I, I've never thought about independent contracts. Like contract. Well, no, it's like, it's like I feel like if that's how they do it, it's probably not that good. Like it's probably not friendly for the people themselves, but maybe it is. I don't know. Well, I mean, it's it. This is the thing. It's it's very much like the rest of capitalism. At the highest level, it's the best possible arrangement, mm. right? At the yeah. highest level, it's the best possible arrangement. Mid to low, it's pretty bad. It's pretty you're going to be scrapping right um it was very interesting i did a thing on aw on uh, not aw on uh, lucha underground uh lucha underground um they it was a uh if you don't know lucha underground was on uh el rey it was a wrestling program but kind of a soap opera as well yeah and it had a bunch of wrestlers and the wrestlers were for the first time in their lives also actors which meant that they received all of the standard stuff you get as an actor right oh, as part wow. of like when you get your sag card your screen actors guild card and the first thing i was talking to the wrestlers about a lot of different things and about wrestling and about um, their lives and the story of lucha underground what it was like working and the fans but the one thing that they all mentioned they were like oh god we have a we have a training table we have we get uh there's a there's a doctor on set right <laughs> they never had that <laughs> They never uh, had that, right? They'd be, yeah, they'd be treated like modern employees. Right. They were being treated. They were being treated basically like, um, would you like to bring a doctor? Like they were being treated like old F one drivers. Like back in the day, that's how F one drivers are treated. Like in the sixties and seventies, they didn't have a doctor on track. What? They didn't have an ambulance on track. Yeah, like if you, you know what Jackie Stewart's entire safety protocol was when he started. I'm getting way off track here, but I promise this is a good payoff. Jackie Stewart's entire safety protocol, and it was the first one that anyone can remember, was he taped a wrench to his wheel so that when he went off track and he ended up in a, like a, a, a chicken coop, he could take the wrench off the wheel, undo the wheel, and get out before he burned to death. That was, <laughs> right? So it, it was full Ivan Drago, like, if we die, we die. If we die, we <laughs> die, right? Like, this is when I go back and say, like, I prefer to have some perspective because people will say, ah, well, sport's an absolute mess. I don't disagree that parts of it are a mess. But when you look at sport overall it, from a historical framework, there's been improvement. Yeah. And the, change, the changes that happened from like 1950 to 2000, way bigger than the obstacles we're facing here. I That's think we're, I think we're good. I think we can handle it. I'm up. I can't believe I'm saying this because I'm traditionally a pessimist. I am optimistic that people can figure out how to make this work. Are we going to lose some stuff? I guarantee you, by the way, we'll lose some stuff. Things will change. Like, And I think there's going to be an interesting thing that's going to happen here. And I'll stop talking after this. But I think there's going to be something that happens here that's going to be quite interesting. I think the second division of college football is in a good spot. I think there's yeah. real potential because I think you're going to get these kind of you know, mega leagues, super leagues, whatever you'll get the big 10, the sec, just, you know, um, eliminating other conferences wholesale. That's already happened yep. in the, you know, RIP to the pac 12, but I think you'll get a very manageable and interesting game at the second. And at, even at the third level, right. Which kind of already exists 
but is sometimes unfairly pitted against the other in these like pay for play games or even within conferences, right? Like there's certainly some conferences right now where you look at the bottom and you look at the top and you say, what are you doing in the same league? You're not even, you don't even have the same ambitions. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. Right. And I, um, and I think, I think something interesting can happen there. It won't be as profitable, but I think it could be pretty cool. Well, I feel like you're already seeing the early signs of that. And I go back mm -hmm. to bowl season where everybody wants to complain about how nobody cares about these bowls. No, no, no. The only people that don't care about the bowls are the two te are, are the teams that are in the two New Year's Six Bowls that aren't playoffs. Like if you go watch the fucking uh, the the Cheez Its Bowl or like the Pop Tarts Bowl, which was awesome because of the absurdity of sacrificing the mm -hmm. Pop Tart, they did it so perfectly. I was very pleased with that. That all that came out, but yeah. like that was a hard fought give a fuck game between Kansas State and NC State. Like they were battling, they were both fighting for ten wins, and I don't mm -hmm. know if Kansas State and NC State make it to a a football Premier League, uh, if you will. But but like I'll watch that, and it's why I like the Big Twelve. Yeah, the Big Twelve may not be on the level of those other conferences, but everybody's close to each other, and so yeah. it's incredibly competitive top to bottom. Meaning you're going to get exciting games every single week. Yeah, and and you know who else cares? Wake Forest cares, man. Go look at Wake Forest bowl record over the last decade. Under Dave Clawson, they've been awesome. I think they have oh, five. Really? Bowl, I think they have five bowl wins, like in that same time span. UNC, their their mate in state. UNC's got one. You want to know who doesn't <laughs> care about bowls? UNC doesn't care about bowls. Wake Forest, Wake Forest is going to knock up for a bowl. They're going to take your bowl because I think at root, like, and you played, so you know this way better than I do. You just want to fight. That's what that's for. You yeah. like like this if you're no, I, I, if you I, put I think, on the helmet, you're just there, you're just there to knock, right? Well, and and bowls are like a fascinating way of so my second year at LSU, first year we won a natty, right? Mm -hmm. And so I saw it from from the mountaintop. Next year we went eight and five, three and five in the SEC. It was like uh if you did that nowadays, there'd be fucking melt hard in Baton Rouge. I think I was kind of chill back then. I don't exactly know how, but um I'll never forget that bowl game. We played Georgia Tech in the Peach Bowl, and it was such a nice way to end the season. Now, if you lost, then it's going to kind of maybe just reinforce all the bad feelings. But we go out and we win that game, and it almost felt like a championship of sorts. Like you got to send your friends, your seniors out on top, and it it meant something to kind of salvaging what was otherwise a pretty brutally unenjoyable year in a lot of ways. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I and 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 and. Football's weird in that it's not actually fun except for game day. And so if you're going to tell me we get another chance to play games yeah. and, and not just practice, like, hell yeah, I'm in. No uh, matter by what. The, way, the, the last time so, the Miami won a bowl game was in 2016, the Russell Athletic Bowl. They beat West Virginia 31-14. I am not a uh, – I call him Mario Christofraud. I, I don't know. I'm not a crystal ball believer. I think he's got mm. a career head coaching record of like 74 and 73. He can recruit. You want it. <laughs> you want like when I don't know what to make of somebody and when I don't really want to have that conversation about somebody, I just find the one thing I know about them and I'll repeat it over and over again, right? Like when you don't want to have that like it's very hard to talk about Taylor Swift on the internet if you're not a Swifty yeah. or if you're not a misogynist, right? I'm in the third category of not my thing. But she supports a lot of things. So what I always do is I'm like, Taylor Swift does a lot of good and she generally is on the side of the angels. So I, su I support Bro, she that, gave right? she gave a million dollars to Louisiana flood relief when we had a Louis right. and like she has no reason to do that. No, uh, after we had like a flood of the century a few years ago. Right. Great person, gives money to the right things, I fully support what she does. Do I want to listen to her music? I'm gonna re I'm gonna repeat this. <laughs> gives money to a lot of great things. Great person. Yeah. Do yeah. not want to have that. So with Mario Cristobal. What I do is this. I go, man, Mario Cristobal, great recruiter. <laughs> the great, you know what happens to great recruiters in college football? Sometimes they just bust through you know, on yeah. their own. True. Like some, like, True so I, if you have to, if you're kind of clueless and you're not entirely sure of what to do, Miami did, like, I think the smartest thing you can do when you don't exactly know what to do, hire a head coach. One, they went and got, uh, an, you get either an offensive line coach or a defensive coordinator. Get one of those two guys. They tend to be real super organized. Two, they went and got a recruiter, a really good one. And three, they got someone who genuinely cares about the program. Um, X's and O's, management, specific, I, uh, 
He's might a great leave recruiter. A bit to be desired. Great and, I recruiter. Mean, that yeah. moment last year <laughs> against those Georgia Tech, right? That was <laughs> when, when the lineman looks at him and goes, "What are we doing?" Yeah, like, yeah, oh that's that's bad. <laughs> that's bad. I mean, I know I kind of know how that goes. I mean, Les Miles had his moments, uh, yeah. certainly back in the day. Um, <clears throat> I, okay, I, I'm going to ask an LSU question here. Mm-hmm. Is it possible for Brian Kelly to be cool? No, but you it's don't just cool. it's it's unsalvageable. It's cool. No, he, yeah, but but. There's nothing. I mean, he's he's pretty engaging when you speak with him. Like, mm-hmm. I think he's actually been pretty chill towards the media, and he's like open and he can't. Sp- I will tell you, he can't do anything right, and I don't think that's his fault necessarily, <laughs> right? Like, it seems to me, and I think this is kind of gonna be like, I think this is how, like, as above, so below. I think this is kind of how it's gonna go with him at LSU, is that he's not ever gonna be able to get it completely right. He had a great quarterback last year, and his mm. defense went to shit. Mm. He had a player who you know, two years ago, two seasons ago, was maybe the best edge rusher in college football, but who can't stay there because he's too small. Because yeah. it doesn't make sense for him to play there, so he can't yeah. get it. He can't get it right with Harold Perkins, even if he gets it right, because we all saw what he was as an edge rusher. But that's clearly not going to work as he gets older and the game gets bigger, meaner, and faster. So they got to put him at his natural position, which isn't where he's going to make the most impact or look as cool, but where he could still be a really good player. Um, Is he going to be like the 12-win guy or even the 11-win guy consistently? No, but he's going to be like 9 or 10. Is he always kind of kind of have something that doesn't work out? It feels like that. It, it, It feels like that. I think, and by the way, like notice at no point if I questioned whether he's a good football coach or not. The guy's a really good at his job. He's actually perfect for this era because he's just got like a super CEO feel to him. And yeah. like this is kind of a time when in a lot of ways, uh, I, I guess kind of ironically, the the football has never meant less to being a head coach in, in many ways. Like, like I, 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 I feel like, and honestly, this is probably the least cool thing ever to say about your coach. I feel like he has great organizational skills. Yeah. Um, like, like he's good at setting up a, a, an organization, but even to your point, like this year, yeah, they hire all these badass defensive coaches, but they have no one on the D line. No. Like, I don't know how you arrive at a time in LSU history where you have a starter, a backup, a Juco transfer, a true freshman and an O lineman that just made the switch a week ago. Like that's their five, that's <laughs> right, their five right. interior defensive linemen going into spring. Like you got five, where on earth are we that, that uh, LSU, the flagship university of the state of Louisiana does not have uh, at least two nimble fat dudes. It's crazy. Louisiana it's crazy. has the highest per capita number of nimble fat dudes. I know, right? Like if, if you want somebody who can dance the most delicate, possible uh cha-cha slide at a good 415 pounds i am starting recruiting in louisiana okay you try and tell me you can't find two of those dudes to play d-line it's 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 kind of wild to behold the the place that produced glenn dorsey and ricky jean francois and booger mcfarland come on man just go find someone with big go find someone with big calves right go find someone with big calves who's playing like pickup basketball that's what i would do the uh so you put me on the adeptus ridiculous podcast which is a warhammer 40k podcast and it's fantastic uh, i was always more of an old world guy like i love warhammer fantasy mm-hmm. um just because i generally yeah. am more of a fantasy guy but by, by um, the way this is this is a test i wanted to ask you this is a dragon test I've, i'm beginning to find that one of the great dividers oh. in nerddom is whether you can deal with dragons or not generally if dragons appear in the lore i'm out and i don't know why is really? just a divider. Yeah, no, you're okay with dragons, right? If you're, I love dragons. Okay. Yeah, dragons okay. are fucking yeah, yeah, awesome, yeah, yeah. dude. Like dragons yeah. are a sick, mythical, ancient creature that speaks to me at like a genetic level. Like right. I'm reading, I'm reading fourth. I'm going through a romanticy thing right now. I'm mm-hmm. simultaneously reading the Court of uh, Thorns and Roses series and the Fourth Wing right. series. And yeah, Fourth Wing is just all dragons. That's all it is. All dragons, okay. all the time, twenty four seven. So like, that's a big. I was never a big Game of Thrones guy because like dragons showed up and I was like, ah, nah not a hate thing it's not a dislike thing it's just like well we've taken a turn that uh i don't take don't hate dragons not anti-dragon look here i'm gonna go back i'm gonna use my trick right 
dragons are an important mythical creature. Yes, yes. I like I like that. when they call them worms. W Y R M. If you're oh, calling a good, your dragon yeah, a worm yeah, yeah. of some sort, I'm like, oh fuck yeah, I get where you come from. Yeah, now. I, I, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. It's just a very important dividing point in our lore. Uh, well, it, and and dragons are kind of like nukes in that they're so powerful that once you introduce them, like it's like mm -hmm. time travel. If you ever introduce time travel in your series, like you're gonna have to deal with a lot of ramifications that come out of that, and right. and th that's kind of like dragons of fantasy. Um, but we all know in 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 the grim dark future, forget right. about progress and forget about goodness. Uh, there is only war right yep. war and death and that is college football like you said it's just a fight mm -hmm. every single weekend um have you thought at all because you're an orc player correct oh yeah correct so probably my favorite thing i learned in the adeptus ridiculous podcast is that orc technology is just powered through belief like right. there's no there's no function Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to make sense. They just have to believe that it makes sense. It, have you found any, is there a program or a team? Have you found any college football parallels to where that orcish belief or style is kind of represented in how they run it? LSU is pretty close, man. Y'all would conquer the world <laughs> if you just would stop. If you just get shit together. <laughs> when you do, you do. Down. Like, it's the most terrifying thing in the world when LSU has things together, right? I always what view them mean? like the Mongols. Like, every now and then... Uh, a, 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 a war leader arises and i guess this is exactly like the orcs right he creates yeah he creates a wah that is unstoppable and rolls over planets but then it yes infighting and other orcish mm -hmm. bullshit gets in the way and you roll a one for animosity and everybody's and nobody does what they're supposed to do that's right that's right it, that's you um your your greatest danger is to yourself and then to everyone else right in that order so I've always said that LSU were the orcs. I always thought that they had the most orc energy. Definitely belief. Definitely a belief oriented. <laughs> like, try to tell me that Les Miles, you're trying to tell me Les Miles didn't get to the gas station on an empty tank simply because he believed the car was going to get there? No. That's so true. That, that man 100% did that. Okay. Um, like, I think they definitely have big orc energy. Uh, any, I think when Arkansas is good, they also have good orc energy because I don't know how any of it's supposed to work. And generally, they got like one big ass dude that they're yep. all following, right? Yep. Like, oh, look, there's Jerry McFadden. Get behind him. Guess he's good. Um, KJ Jefferson's huge. Follow him through the fray. Is, yeah. That's a big bro. I was looking up uh, Matt Jones combine numbers the other day. <laughs> Matt Jones oh, oh, was man. like 6'7", ran mm -hmm. a 4'3", 40 at 250. He jumped like 34 inches. He yeah. was the biggest of big fuckers. Yeah, you know what? Matt Jones got into trouble uh, for realizing he was Matt Jones. So Matt Jones was like, yeah, I'm going to party. Yeah. Why wouldn't you? Have you seen you in the mirror? Have you seen your combine numbers? <laughs> yeah, exactly. hey, hey, listen, everybody who's untalented, everybody who has not one whit of athletic ability will get on the internet and be like, oh, if he'd only devoted himself. Screw you. Have you seen <laughs> what that guy was? I would have been so arrogant. I would have been like, nah. I got this licked. I'm just going to go be a wide receiver in the NFL, despite so having crazy, never dude. played it. Yeah. It's so insane. And he was good. And like you said, he was good. It was just the off the field stuff that kind of got him. Uh, if you had been anybody, by the way, who'd been like, hey, can you operate with two illicit substances in your bloodstream in a professional sporting environment? Matt Jones would be my number one draft pick. Maybe, maybe number two, right? Like if Randy Moss had been like, if Randy Moss had made the decision to be like, yeah, I'm going to get on some sort of like, weird russian pro stimulant you know, synthetic like horse hormone in my blood i'd be like randy could handle it because i believe Dude, randy can handle anything i think i think the prime example of that is um i mean it's got to be lt yeah. mild man mild man talks about uh he, some of my favorite stories and he's a classic like telling the same stories again and again and again and i just make him repeat him because i'm like a little kid i just sit at his feet and i love him but hearing him describe looking at Lawrence Taylor and coming off the edge and he's got his coked out bloodshot eyes. He said, mm -hmm. he just looked like a demon and he would be like slobbering and just, just, mm -hmm. you could feel the rage, a, a true follower of corn. It was real yeah. blood for the blood. God energy. Most blood, the, like the most blood for the blood God player, like, and a guy who, by the way, if you were go, Hey, LT, maybe, maybe you shouldn't play when you're high on free base cocaine <laughs> are you going to be the one to say that Hell did you no. see the results <laughs> did you notice bill parcells did not 
take that yeah. tack publicly? Yeah. No, not the greatest coach of his era. He wasn't going to do that. I'm not going to do that. LT was clearly on another level. Whatever he was dealing with must have required that, and that could be my only assumption because he can throw me through a window. Uh, and we're wrapping up here, so just because I've already kept you so long. Uh, wh which college coach do you think that would be most prone to giving in to the taint of chaos, to to <laughs> leaving the path of righteousness and uh, uh, foregoing the emperor's golden light? Ooh, current college coaches who would be uh who are going to or have already given in to I mean is it is it is is Lane Kiffin up there? He, he's he's not I guess not as much from a personality type of standpoint, but he is certainly in this in this new age, he has leaned fully into it. Um I am going to consider all right, so one. I think that Mike Norvell is closer than anyone accepts oh. to being that guy because at no point are they, at no point are they shook in a way that's yeah. almost terrifying. Like FSU teams, FSU teams are so aggressive and they play so loose, even if they're down like, you know, 10, 14, 17 points. Ah, no, it's cool. We're just going to go for it on fourth. I think another guy who's quietly far more chaotic than people know is Dan Lanning. Dan Lanning uh, doesn't sweat. Those are the guys who I think are closest to chaos because they just go, nope, that's the decision we're making. Too too bad. Too bad. That's, that's, that's what we're going with. You know, I don't think the SEC has a whole lot of those guys. I think you kind of have to go a little further afield for that. I think you, you know, have to go up to the Big Ten. I think really get those guys. I think um, Lanning's cool, man. We got to talk to him recently. That is just a cool cat. Also, the Dan Lanning tattoo is one of my favorite things in the world, specifically the Outback Steakhouse boomerang, which I talked to him about. <laughs> and yeah. I I mentioned that I like told my wife or, that I loved her for the first time in front of a Chili's when we were in high school. Yeah, And uh, he told me that Outback and Chili's are not on the same level. I don't know that I agree. Where do you where do you fall on that divide? Hmm. I like is Outback Steakhouse no, that I, much better than Chili's? I know. How's this? I I think it is a degree up. Yeah, I you think do. Now, okay. Now, and by so the way, with that, no, and I think that's a funny. Now I will agree. <laughs> I think that is a funny decision we're having to make here. But if I'm gonna be honest, <laughs> I think more stuff at Chili's comes out of the microwave than an Outback, and I think the degree of cooking difficulty. Okay, because at Chili's, how many times have you asked, how would you like that? I know at Outback, I'm at least given one option. One, right? So the level of difficulty has to be higher. Like even by a margin, y'all, I'm not saying it's a standard deviation. But I do think if you're a cook, you, you got you to gotta shift it up at least a gear to make it at the Outback to a level that, that you don't have to at the Chili's. I mean, speaking of chaos. Chili's has done a lot for me in my life, okay? It's given me a lot. I don't want to Spend insult it. it. I mean, okay. speaking of chaos, no rules, just right feels pretty chaotic, right? Like, <laughs> fuck it, I'm gonna do what feels right. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lean into what is, uh, what, what whatever my body wants to do at the time. I'm not like, saying better. This giant blooming onion. Right, uh, right. I'm not saying better. You can become a depraved animal at either restaurant, but only one. By the way, only one of those restaurants has been the accepted general cultural like we all agreed on it it's been the setting for a famous episode of television where somebody had their wild night out like like in the office they didn't go to an outback to completely lose their shit no they went to a chili's um spencer there's been so much fun man uh spencer hall you already know him if you're listening to this show uh edbs follow him of course uh channel six go sign up him and holly two things a week it's awesome it's unique it's very intelligent, uh, which I, I appreciate as well. But um, thank you so much for doing this, man. Where are you at with your uh, with your 40K army? Are we actively painting right now? No, I kind of go in guys, and out. No, no, you guys, I'm going to reach behind me here. I'm going to show you a little project, which is relevant. Hell so yeah, I am working on uh, my boys, all of my little orcs at the moment. So what you're getting right now is you're getting the, uh, I'm painting up. My grimy Ooh, orcs. Look you can at see. that, dude. But, but this is not the one that I wanted to show you. This is the standard, right? Yeah. So what I am showing you is this. 
if you'll notice, that is going to be an airbrushed purple, and it's going to have yellow dots because I wanted an LSU themed <laughs> squig off for this. Okay, so so, so that's going to be there's going to be little yellow streaks on there, and it's going to be an LSU themed steed for this orc rider. So okay, so now I'm going to reach behind me. Oh, here we go! I love it. I love it, T. Bob A. Bear. This is my. So you never played Blood Bowl, did you? No, uh, I have. I have a box right here. Okay. Right. Just paint. So these are from a few years ago. I think my painting's gotten better since this. But these are bad. But this is my Blood Bowl orc team based on the 2011 LSU Tigers. <laughs> so that is uh, that is Garrett Lee. Uh, I also have a Jordan <laughs> Jefferson in there, right there. I believe this is this is That's Michael beautiful. Brockers. Yeah, that, right that, here. Uh, you know what? These all have a similarity. Yeah, dude. So I love uh, it. That's 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 very odd that you also have them at hand. So was that your airbrush in the picture you tweeted out earlier? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my. The, well, no, no. That one is um that belongs to Marco Frizzoni. That does. But I do have an airbrush. Okay, because I've been I've been thinking about getting an airbrush. Whenever I get out of, I'm addicted to World of Warcraft again right now. It happens every mm -hmm. so often. Yeah. Whenever I get back out of it, I do have my full Bretonian army to spend five years oh, putting together and painting. Listen, which the airbrush is going to speed about. that up. We can we can talk about specs. You definitely need one. Uh, you tell your wife it's an investment. You you get more time back than you spend. Oh yeah, it. because yeah, because you're not yeah, because you're, oh, you're what, all of a sudden I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> it's what's taking me five years. Look at all the time I can devote to everything else now. My main goal for the Bretonian army is to have a regiment of knights all painted in uh different SEC themes, right? Because mm -hmm. when I see Kentucky's checkerboard, that's all I can think about are medieval knights or Tennessee's checkerboard or or purple and gold mm -hmm. or crimson or whatever. So I I red and black. For yep. Georgia, a little silver in there as well. I can't wait. Um, uh, I will tell you, by the way, one side effect of all of this is that I now look at uniforms differently. I look at it and I go, that's a that's a pretty good color combination. There. <laughs> I like it. Spencer Hall, thank you so much, man. This has been awesome, dude. All right, thanks, y'all. All right, we're going to close the show next. First, a message from our friends at DraftKings. DraftKings, the leader. Get in on the action with the DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports fitting partner of the NBA. Check this out, guys. If you're a new customer, use the promo code TBOB, T-B-O-B. You deposit $5 or more, you get a no-sweat bet up to $1,000, which if you lose, you'll get that money back in bonus bets, okay? So, for me, South Louisiana, I'm a massive Pelicans fan. The birds are hot right now. I'm playing props. I'm betting lines. But the point is, I'm supporting the birds. Look, you bet however you see fit. Your favorite NBA team, your favorite trends. It's all there for you. The place to play is the DraftKings Sportsbook. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code TBOB, T-B-O-B, and new customers get a no-sweat bet up to $1,000 if your first bet loses. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code TBOB. The crown is yours. Uh, hey, thank you all so much for hanging out today and for indulging me. Go talk says you're getting me into whatever this is. Uh, look, man, if you like miniatures or you've ever thought about painting miniatures, there's an entire world out there for you. It could be 40 K. It could be Warhammer fantasy. Um, either way, it's, it's, it's a ton of fun. Just go to your local board game shop. Maybe pick up a, pick up a little box, pick up some troops and, uh, start to explore it. A little bit. Royal painted just logged on to over. I know, guys. Sorry, we had to go early days. So sometimes we have guests. We we you know we got to accommodate their schedule. And so this was the time that 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 Spencer could do it. Um, but if you want to help the show, hit the like button, share it with your friends. If you're listening on podcast, rate and review. These are all free, easy things you can do to to help us out a bit. Um, Will Wiser, what time slash days y'all go live? So Monday, Tuesday, Thursday is the off season schedule. Uh, but we have daily uploads and breakouts. So, like, <laughs> if you subscribe to YouTube.com slash at Volume Snap, excuse me, um, you'll get daily content there for sure. Uh, and then, yeah, you can turn the noties on, like Zach says in the chat. Turn the notifications on if you want to know exactly when we're going live. But I, I get it, right? We get so many notifications 24-7 that eventually, like, it's 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 like the 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 paradox of choice, Right where suddenly you, you would think that having more choices is uh, desirable, right? But all of a sudden, like think about how when you sit down to watch a television show, you have so many options that it actually becomes harder to make a choice. 
uh in that same way we get so many notifications that i feel you it's like fucking like hard to actually decide which ones matter and which ones don't world paints as i watch next round live then you guys hell yeah dude i like next round next round guys are awesome um i think it's gonna be it for today's show again massive thank you to pat gunther chris tran danny cardenas all the homies in the chat uh Aaron will be back from Disney next week. So we'll get a full Disney recap. It seems like our boy is thriving over there. And um, yeah, it's going to be fun. Yeah, except for the beer chug. I, I agree. So we'll, we'll give Aaron a lot of shit about this. But we had like an entire 15 minute uh, exchange in our group text about him chugging a beer aaron's not really that much of a drinker and he's definitely not a chugger and i was like i doubt aaron can even chug a beer without stopping and all we wanted was film proof and all this motherfucker did was send a picture of him drinking a beer refused to chug it wouldn't even try hate to see it so we're definitely going to shame aaron about that next week we'll talk about disney and we'll get to all of uh the college football news that breaks <laughs> over the weekend um something we even talked about today zach arnett joining Ole miss as an analyst that's some real cuck energy but we can get there a bit later uh all right we love you so much thank you and we'll see you for another snaps live monday until then i hope you all have a wonderful weekend also i'm going to my brother's bachelor party part two which i expect we'll get some good stories out of as well so keep it locked and we'll see you monday